I was going to turn it down, but. Mark chapter 1, we'll be back in verse, starting with verse 21 again. Everybody there? Okay, Mark, Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 21. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on, immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so that they debated among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. And all God's people said, Amen. Demons. This is our first confrontation uh, as seen other than that time whenever in the wilderness, the Lord Jesus himself was face to face with Satan. This is the first time in the uh, life of the Messiah where there is this direct confrontation with demon and evil spirit. Uh, we have looked at several things about them already, uh, but just to remind us on one point, uh, there's two viable options for what demons are. The scripture doesn't really tell us exactly. Uh, the one that is is uh, held by, by many, uh, I would call them competent people, um, trustworthy expositors, um, believe that they are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood. Uh, remember, they are not, they are neither human nor angel. They're a hybrid and they are a, a different sort of being. Um, while that is acceptable to many, it's not one that, that I feel comfortable with, um, but it is a possibility. The one that I believe is most accurate and can be, have the best biblical uh, sustaining is that of the fallen angels. The angels remember that uh, prior to the creation of Adam and Eve uh, and the pre-Adamic rebellion of Lucifer, um, the, uh, the highest of all of God's created order of beings, um, fomented a rebellion. You find this out in the book of Job and uh, you find it also in uh, Ezekiel uh, uh, 28 and Isaiah 14, where uh, because of that rebellion, um, about a third of the angels, according to Revelation, followed him in his rebellion, which is millions and millions of rebel angels. Those are, to me, most identifiable as the demons. The word itself, if I can get this to change over here. It's not cooperating with me. Uh, demonian, uh, the basic meaning is simply one causing disruption or a tearing apart is the Greek meaning of the word. Uh, a, a writer by the name of G.H. Pember in his book, The Earth's Earliest Ages, says that it probably also refers to a spirit with superior knowledge. Of course, these beings have been in existence if they are the fallen angels, as I believe that they, uh, they have been ex in existence long before man ever came around. Uh, they were in existence in the time frame uh, that falls between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, uh, where uh, they were uh, with God, they were in God's realm, in God's kingdom. 
Uh, Satan had his own throne. He was over all of the other angels. Satan himself was the highest of all the created uh, beings. It says that uh, he is the standard by which everything else is measured. He had the highest created intelligence, the highest created beauty, uh, and all of those things. <clears throat> but he filled himself with arrogance. Pride is a term that many people prefer to use. But the problem is, is that many people say, well, I'm not a prideful person. Um, and, and yet they don't go along with what God has said in his word. And that is arrogance. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, sort of a English, at least in the English language, uh, a bad understanding of the word pride. That's why you find me using the word arrogance more than pride. But it is pride. Uh, the other word um, from uh, Matthew 8, 16, go ahead and just flip over there real quick. Matthew 8, 16. It says, when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. Uh, Demonismi is the word there, which means that a person is possessed uh, with one or more demons that are, that are invading that person's uh, body and controlling the body of an unbeliever. Uh, another word is to have a demon. Uh, that, uh, that word is echodemonian, and it is not really used except of people accusing the Lord Jesus Christ of having a demon. Now, something else that is interesting, if you look at our passage we looked at uh, today back in Luke, not Luke, Mark, I'm so sorry, Mark, mark it down, our ark. If you look, it said uh, there was a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out. The he is the demon. The demon, though, is using the man's vocal cords to be able to speak. He is not speaking independent of the person, but he is speaking and acting through the person. And he says, what business do we have to do with each other? In other words, go away. Let me have what I want to do. Um, and then he said, you're the Holy One of God. He rebuked him. Why? Well, we've said there's two reasons for it. One is that demons are not very trustworthy witnesses. Uh, and secondly, if they do tell the truth about anything, it is only for the purposes of deception. Now, hang on to that. Hold, uh, remember, remember the word deception. Uh, that is the modus operandi. That is the way that that, that Satan and the demons operate, and that is through deception. As we get closer and closer to the tribulation period, satanic, demonic deception is going to greatly increase, and people will be paying more and more attention to doctrines of demons. That's both within the church and within the world in which we live. Uh, we will be, I'm, I'm contemplating doing a, a special study on uh, the the time of the end and dealing with the demonic, uh, but uh, we'll just let that go by today. But what you have here, even though this word uh, is not in the scriptures, uh, and, and, and gastromuthos means um, a ventriloquist. It's a ventriloquist. Um, uh, R.B. Theme writes, this word is not used in the New Testament, although situations that indicate a ventriloquist demon um, and gastromoths uh, is present are quite numerous. For example, this one here where they are speaking. They control the vocal cords uh, of the person. Just jot down in your notes, Isaiah 8, 19, Isaiah 8, 19, and look it up on your own later, Isaiah 8. 19. So under these circumstances, uh, a demon may speak in different languages. Now, there's often been times of just reported experiences where suddenly somebody uh, will start speaking a language that they had never spoken before. 
Uh, now, we know that the spiritual gift of tongues is where the person themselves um, starts speaking a language that they never learn. Now, tongues was useful and was needed at the beginning of the church age. After 70 AD, the spiritual gift of tongues was no longer necessary within the church. The spiritual gift of tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, was for the purpose of convincing unbelieving Jews um, about the reality of the Messiah and the fact, and this is the main focus, uh, as he quoted out of Isaiah, uh, that uh, Paul writes, and that is that it is there to warn unbelieving Jews about the judgment that was coming. We cover that in the spiritual gifts study. But here, the person is not speaking a foreign language, but the demon is using them, the ventriloquist demon speaking through their vocal cords. And um, sometimes they will uh, speak uh, to uh, another person in their own language, even though the person that is demon possessed has never spoken the language, uh, or they may start rattling on in another language. Remember, these demons have been around forever, um, and not forever, but but uh, since, since they were created back before man was created. Uh, and they know, I'm sure, just about any language that you would want them to know. Uh, so um, if that kind of a thing happens, once again, how do you deal with somebody who is demon-possessed? What, what, are you supposed to go through and do an exorcism? No. Uh, are you supposed to, you know, in the name of Jesus, I command you and all this other? No. Now, what does that person need? They need eternal life. They need the Holy Spirit. The only thing that they need is to hear the scriptures that has to do with how do you receive eternal life. John 3, 16, John 5, 24, John 6, 47, John 11, 25, 26. So just stick with the scripture. Let the word of God do the work. Uh, but uh, probably you'll never run into that. But as we get closer to the end of the age, I would not be surprised at anything. Also, when people sometimes go to mediums, um, that still happens a lot today. People who are uh, astrologers, uh, people who get involved in seances, people who attempt to communicate with the dead, uh, which is called necromancy, which is absolutely forbidden in the scripture. Sometimes they will go to a medium uh, because they're desperate for their loved one and they're they just know the loved one is there somewhere, and if they could just talk to them and make sure everything's okay, and la di da di da. And suddenly, would you include tarot cards in that? I would include tarot cards, anything dealing with the occult, absolutely. Uh, uh, Ouija boards, the whole nine yards, those are extremely dangerous, uh, and they connect you with the occult, and you are not going to want to have that happen. Uh, remember, as a believer, you cannot be demon-possessed, but you can come under demonic influence. But they may in, imitate a dead person. They may know all kinds of things about them. How is that possible? Well, they've been watching you. <laughs> they've been watching the person. Uh, they know all kinds of things. And as they study us, uh, remember, it's all about deception. It's all about deception. The word medium is simply a translation of the Hebrew word boa, which simply is the, the Greek, in the Greek, it's the same equivalent as ventriloquist. That's what a medium is, is someone, a true medium, when they're demon possessed, it's the demon that's doing the speaking. Um, but given that as it is, then uh, what is demon possession? Um, well, let's see. Let me go back on this thing about the ventriloquist uh, demon. It says that ventriloquist demon sometimes produces within the medium a strange cacophony of whispers or high sounds and mutters. That's out of the Isaiah passage or low sounds. At other times, he projects his voice out from the ground, up from the table or down from the ceiling. Frequently, the demon controls the vocal cords of the medium in a clever impersonation of the dead. The Agostothromos demon must possess and control the mediums through whom they speak. This is from R.B. Thing Jr. Um, in his uh, book, Satan and Demonism. For example, a demon who indwelt someone in India a thousand years ago may presently indwell someone in Los Angeles. 
Though this person, or through this person, the ventriloquist demon impersonates any number of people from India who lived during that ancient time. Since no language barriers exist for demons, the demon is able to make it seem as if those personages from different eras of history are projected into our century. There have been people, and I did, didn't, don't, don't want to take time to dig into this, but people who say that, that they have uh, had a, a white master or someone uh, from the other side that then gives them all these uh, you know, things to write down and they communicate and so forth and so forth and so forth. And some of those things have become very popular in our time and in our age. Uh, but please understand that they are demons. They will present themselves as some person from India long ago, perhaps even a famous person or China or somewhere else. But please understand it is all demonic. The dead do not come back. The dead do not speak to us. So anytime you're involved in that, you are in trouble. Uh, mankind, remember, is divided into only two categories, believers and unbelievers. Demons can enter, they can live, and they can exit unbelievers, but not believers. Uh, now look at something interesting. Go with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, verses 26 through 30. John 13 26 through 30. This is at the Last Supper. This is a part of the Last Supper that is uh, that uh, sometimes we preach a sermon on or whatever, but it is not normally for us uh, when we are practicing our own uh, remembrance of the Lord. We don't uh, deal with these verses, but it happened at the time of the Last Supper. Um, let's, uh, let's just pick up a 21. When Jesus has said this, John 13, 21, when Jesus has said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That would have been the apostle John himself. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, leaning back on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? And then he answered, "This that it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, you know what's interesting? The disciples had asked him a question. He answered the question, and nobody paid attention. They didn't pay any attention. He said, this is it. So it says, look, um, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now look at 27. After the morsel, Satan, the fallen angel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. The him there could either be directed towards Satan, but most likely it's directed toward Judas. Because Judas had already plotted and planned this to begin with. Satan had come in to, in to give him a special determination or power, if you will, to go forth to do what he said he had already decided he was going to do. 28, and here's where I said they, don't, they didn't pay any attention. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he said this to him. <laughs> you know, how many times have we been in church and walked outside and didn't have a clue of what we just studied? Well, it got real quiet in here, didn't it, all of a sudden? Let's read notes. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you take notes, and that's why we have it online so that you can go back and look at it. And uh, 20, uh, 29, for some were supposing because Judas had the money box, Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have in need of the feast, or else we should give him something or give something to the poor. <laughs> Where did they come up with that? They were just not paying any attention. But anyhow, so after receiving the morsel, he, that is Judas, went out immediately, and it was night. By the way, that's part of the thing within John, always the distinction between light and dark and light and dark. And so he is now possessed by Satan. So the fallen angel Satan entered into the body of Judas to influence him into the betrayal of Messiah. Satan didn't force this on Judas. He still had his free will. 
Um, like I said, he had already decided this is what he was going to do. He'd already plotted and planned with the Pharisees. But the inner persuasion of the enemy working with Judas' sin nature and no doubt his false ideas about the mission of the Messiah gave him the courage and the inner drive to such a sin. You can get, get, you go on your own and mark down Luke 22, 47 and 48, Luke 22, 47 and 48, and John 18, 1 through 5. John 18, 1 through 5. So after the betrayal, it's obvious that Satan abandoned Judas, for he went out with remorse and committed suicide, Matthew 27, the first 10 verses. Matthew 27, the first 10 verses. Listen, from this incident alone, it's obvious Satan doesn't care about you. Neither do the demons. Satan only wants to use people for his purposes, and he abandons them because why? He cares about nobody but himself. Why fallen angels and demons strive to inhabit human beings other than to accomplish a specific purpose is not exactly known. Uh, there are some theories, uh, but what we can say is that they can and do possess people. Remember, one of the arguments for the idea that the uh, demons are the disembodied spirits of Nephilim from Genesis 6, the hybrids where they're neither human nor angel, um, is that they are bodiless and they seek bodies to inhabit. Well, that may be true, but angels, they have a body of sorts. They can manifest. They do have a body and yet able to enter spiritually, enter into and possess. Here is Satan possessing Judas himself. So that argument that, that has to be, since angels have some type of body and the the so uh, the Nephilim would not have a body, it's, it sort of falls apart based upon this, this um, incident here with Judas. Um, <clears throat> the fallen angels are organized into an army. In Ephesians chapter six, they work under Satan's operational methods in Ephesians 6, it says that we know his methods. His methodia means his cunning, his deception, his trickery, his strategies to work against God's plan in time and believers. Satan was working constantly, first in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the wilderness with the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, working against God's plan, working against the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then you see demons all along the line all around the Lord and, and you know, saying things like, you're the holy one, you're the holy one. All of that in the process of attempting to go into greater deception. You see Satan working to try and keep keep uh, Jesus from going to the cross, to try and and um, then possess uh, here, to possess uh, um, uh, Judas. So a constant activity. You'll see another activity uh, in... Um, Matthew 16, it's called demonic influence. Go with me to Matthew 16. And this is where believers can get into trouble. Matthew 16, 21 to 23. Remember, demon possession is where the demon actually inhabits the body of the person, not their soul, but the body of the person. Demonic influence is an attack on the person's thinking and can happen to both an unbeliever and a believer. Here it happens to the believer, the apostle Peter. Matthew 16, 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. <laughs> Peter. The one with foot and mouth disease. Put his foot in his mouth. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord. Now, how can he be Lord if you're trying to tell him what to do? By the way, a lot of believers do that. We'll sing the song, he is Lord, he is Lord. And we say, study to show yourself approved under God. Work in your Bibles and read your Bibles. Oh, no, Lord, I don't have time. No, Lord, or is a contradiction in terms. You cannot say no and Lord at the same time. Frank. You can say yes, Lord, but you can't say no, Lord. 
So he's doing a contradiction. God forbid it. Lord, who's the one that Jesus was? He was God. He was operating under the plans of God the Father. Said, so this shall never happen to you. Now look, but he that is Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Now he's he says, get thee behind me, Satan, because why? Satan is right there influencing the thinking of Peter. But the Lord says to Peter, you, Peter, are a stumbling block to me. Why? You're not setting your mind on God's interest. What do we say every time? Set your mind on things above and not on the things of this earth. And that's exactly what Peter was doing. He was following human viewpoint thinking in the very presence of the divine viewpoint himself, the living word. That was demonic influence. That did not happen apart from his free will because Peter was still struggling with coming to the reality that Jesus was going to have to die. We know that that continued on because even when uh, the Lord was arrested, you know, Peter tried to chop off the ear of the high priest servant Malthus. And then, and then whenever it, all of it was going on, uh, you know, in the, in the whole process of the trials, where's Peter? He's standing outside afraid to admit anything. And he just curses and swear, goes back to his old ways as a, uh, as a sailor and says, I don't know the man. He never got it until later. But you know, what's amazing. What did the Lord do? He's not only restored him, but he made him the first pastor. Ain't that amazing? A person can become completely overwhelmed by demonic influence. Why? By paying attention to the things of this world. Setting your mind on God's interest, not man's. You have become under, you have come under the influence of the demonic, under satanic thinking. Anytime we think independent of the word of God, the only other option is the human viewpoint. And the human viewpoint is always the satanic viewpoint. Demon influence. They can become serious oppression. And this is a personal opinion. I think that such oppression, that is of a person who as a believer is rejecting the word and they're living in human viewpoint uh, they can become seriously oppressed and it can mimic demonic possession, but it can never be a possession. Jesus let the believer Peter know the source of his thinking was demonic. The, uh, you see, Peter was accountable for his thinking. He couldn't say the devil made me do it. Peter was persuaded of false thinking. He had his ideas about what the Messiah would be. And the idea of a suffering servant Messiah still was not in the forefront of his thinking. He was still not right in his doctrine. Because he was wrong in his doctrine, the only other option was the satanic viewpoint, which is synonymous with the human viewpoint. Uh, demons... Uh, cannot enter into the body of believers. Um, but they can have a strong influence on them. In 1 John 4, 4, it says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, that is, those that oppose the Lord, because greater is he, that is, God, who is in you, than he who is in the world, who is Satan and the demons. So demon possession is that internal reality it cannot happen to a believer. However, the external reality is demon influence. The believe, we live in a world deeply influenced by Satan. Remember, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 4, 5. We, we're like fish swimming in water and don't even recognize at how wicked this world is in which we live. Now it's becoming ever more so away from the Lord almost on a daily basis right now as we are we are racing forward uh, to 
the reality of what will be in the tribulation, which occurs after the rapture of the church. Um, listen to turning your Bibles to John James, excuse me, James chapter three, James chapter three. James chapter three, verses 14 through 16. James three, 14 to 16. We've got a few minutes left. Are you there? Say amen. If you're not there, say oh me. Okay. John 3, 14 through 16. All right. Here we go. Now listen to it. You look at it. You look at it carefully and think about this because you may find yourself that you have been and you are in demonic influence right now. You ready? It says, but if you have bitter jealousy, and selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom, this way of operating, is not that which comes down from above. That would be the divine viewpoint. But, but is earthly. That is the cosmic system of Satan. Natural, coming out of your sin nature. And what's that last word? Demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Now, you need to ponder that. There is a wisdom that is demonic. Wisdom is simply a means of how I'm supposed to live in this world. Demonic influence, there are two things. And by the way, it's, it says in 1 Timothy 4.1, the Spirit explicit, explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's in the latter times. We're in those latter times. And there is a steady increase of demonic influence everywhere. We're going to talk about some of that down the road. False doctrine has its source in the demonic. When people pay attention to false doctrine, they're under the deception of demonic influence. The number two things, here we go, jot these down. The number two, or the number, there are two key doctrines that are the doctrine of demons. You can sum up most everything out of these two. The number one is you can live life independent of God and his word and still be satisfied. The number one doctrine of demons, you can live independent of God and his word and achieve satisfaction. Remember Eve in the Garden of Eden. He said, you don't have to pay attention to what God said. You live independent of God. Be your own woman. I am woman, Eve says, hear me roar. Uh -huh. Remember in the pre-Adamic angelic rebellion, Satan himself went around from angel to angel and, and convinced those that followed him that they didn't have to respond positive to God. They could just be positive towards Satan and himself. They can live independent of God. So the number one doctrine is that a person can live independent of God and his word and still achieve true satisfaction. The number two doctrine is that there's salvation independent of a savior. That there is salvation independent of a savior. You can achieve salvation on your own. The number two doctrine of demons is there is salvation independent of a savior and you can achieve it on your own. Every religion in the world is works-based. Let me say this and say it clearly, and I'm done. Mm -hmm. Any church that says you have to do something, be something, rituals, go through some ritual of something, is demonic. It is demonic. By grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right. The doctrine of demons says it is you plus something. Right. You plus something. And the vast majority of so-called Christian churches are demonic. That'll probably get me into a lot of trouble. But it is absolutely true. You cannot go against the clear doctrine that, that Jesus said, he who believes in me has everlasting life. You change that, you add to that, you put something in between, 
those words, he who believes in me has, you put anything between believes in me and has, and you are now in demonic thinking. Why can't we all just get along? Because what fellowship has God with demons? Right. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this time around your word. Uh, Lord, there's been some tough things to have to say and to look at with this reality. But Father, as we move ever deeper into the end times before the coming of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we know that the doctrine of demons is going to increase. The influence of the demonic is going to increase even over believers. So Father, may we always hang on to the truth, hang on to it solidly and get it deep into our souls so that we can always tell the difference between reality and deception. For in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, church, we've got about 12 minutes today. I shorted you a little. Thank you.